You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 88, Drugs, Love, and Anarchy. Let's go. Hey, what's up? And welcome back, all my fellow Liberty Entrepreneurs around the world. I'm Ash Oro, and I'm here with one of the best people in the world. And I say that, he didn't pay me to say that, but this is <laughs> one of my good friends and someone that I respect so much. And it's such a pleasure to have him on the show, Sterling Lujan. Hey, brother. Hey, Ash. Thanks for having me, man. And the feeling's 100% mutual. I appreciate Lots that. Lots of love. Yeah, so Sterling is currently the communications ambassador for Bitcoin.com, and many of you may know him as the Psychologic Anarchist, and we'll get into what that means soon. Uh, you can find him at SterlingLujan.com, that's S-T-E-R-L-I-N-L-U-J-A-N.com, so definitely go check him out. Sterling, if you don't mind, give us just a quick background of who you are and what you stand for. Sure. You're, are you sure you want it to be quick, Ash? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, most people know that I'm an anarchist. If they've ever checked out my material or looked up my name on Google, you find me pretty quickly. But I became an anarchist through a certain set of experiences rather than reading a bunch of books or just focusing on the logic of what it means to be an anarchist. You know, that's sort of the traditional mm. route that most people take. So back in 2009, roughly 2009, I was, actually, let's go back just a little bit further. There's something I want to touch on. So around 2006, 2007, I was an unthinking, slobbering zombie who was sort of drooling his way through life, right? All I did was play video games all the time. I was a college dropout. I was working on a degree at a technical college for graphic design and graphic arts, but I didn't finish that degree. I quit because I was more interested in playing video games and sort of just living an unproductive life, not doing anything. I didn't have any drive or ambition or passion about anything whatsoever. Then in roughly, yeah, it was about 2007, I think. Maybe it was 2006. I was about 20 six or seven years old and a good friend of mine invited me over to his house and told me that I needed to try something. So I went over to my buddy's house and he said, here, take this pill. It's going to make you really happy. Well, that was an understatement. The, the pill that he gave me was MDMA or methylene methamphetamine, which is the street name or that's the pharmaceutical name for ecstasy. Right, which now a lot of the kids are calling Molly. Right, MDMA. But sometimes Molly can be adulterated and be other things, but that's a that's sort of another story. So I took MDMA, and this was actual MDMA, and I had an epiphany at where I had finally realized that I could do much, so much more with my life. I realized that I was a lot more intelligent than I had previously thought, and I I. I also had the insight that I was going by what I was told as I was growing up. I was in remedial mathematics classes. I wasn't really very intelligent according to the public education system. I, I felt like I was a, you know, sort of this Debbie Downer of a child who wasn't going to do anything with his life. And that's and, real, right? Whenever you you don't fit into the public education system, that, that's a real thing on a kid. Yes, it absolutely is. Well, they want to, the public education system is sort of a, they want it to be a one size fits all solution for every child in terms of the way that they go through that process. But also it's a one size fits all process of indoctrination and, and brainwashing camp. Mm -hmm. So as long as everybody fits the mold of what they want to do, then they're extremely happy. Well, I wasn't really wanting to give in to their curriculum. I wanted to read my own books. I wanted to study my own material. I wanted to be my individual self and they weren't really having it. So I had this insight, this epiphany on MDMA, and I realized that, man, I, I really love life. I love the people who are in my life, and I haven't really done much to further it. So at that point, I decided I wanted to go back to college, and now I, I knew I was really interested in the mind. I was interested in people. I was interested in how people relate to one another. So this epiphany caused it also, there's another point of it, 
it also caused me to question the nature of the laws in society, right? I took MDMA and this made me want to go back to school. It made me want to do something with myself. I thought, why the hell is this drug, this beautiful, amazing, magnificent compound illegal? Mm. It shouldn't be illegal. It's, it just woke me up. It woke me the right. fuck up. Right. And so I went back to college. I got a bachelor's degree in psychology. And then a little, that, that was later down the road, of course, around 2009, I thought this compound was so amazing that I started handing it out to people. I started giving it to my friends specifically, selling it to my friends. And then I thought that I was going to be a shaman or a spiritual technologist and just help wake everybody up. Sure, yeah. that, that was my modus operandi for the longest time with MDMA. And then I, and then in 2009, things didn't go exactly my way. And the a friend of mine, he sold some of my MDMA to an undercover narcotics oh, really? agent. Actually, at that time, it was cocaine. We had cocaine and MDMA. He sold some cocaine to an undercover narcotics agent. And then they came back and kicked open my door to my house mm. like a full, effectively a full SWAT team with full body armor, vests, machine guns, the whole nine yards. They, they acted like they were maintenance men for the apartment and effectively tricked me and threw me to the ground. And then of course the whole raid team came up and searched the apartment fully. Luckily I wasn't armed because I likely would have shot that cop who tried to open the door because I had no idea who, you know, who it was. I thought it was just a robber. I mean, it was a robber. It yeah. Was, yeah. It, I was going to say they, they were state thugs. I thought it was yeah. a, a, you know, a, nor a, pri a, a private robber. That's right. A non-authoritarian robber. Right. right. The state functionary. So I was charged with possession of MDMA and cocaine with intent to deliver. And also they accused me of manufacturing a controlled substance. Mm. And I had to bond out. The bond was like 10 K I believe at that time. And then later on down the road, it took a year for me to go to court because the, the dr war on drugs has caused the, the quote unquote criminal justice system to become so full just and loaded yeah, yeah, that nobody gets in until the very last minute. So that was a very tough year of my life. I was effectively waiting to go to prison. I was being threatened with 40 years in prison. I was absolutely terrified that that was my wow. life was going to be over. But at the same time, this year was a very strong or a pivotal moment in my life because I started having thoughts about the nature of the state and the experience, what had happened to me. Oh, I bet. And a lot of people, yeah, man, it was rough. There, and a lot of people in my life were trying to make me feel guilty. They were trying to say that I made a huge mistake. And I started thinking, how was this a mistake? I was only helping people out in a market environment. And, find, and helping them find their pursuit of happiness. You know, Roger yeah. Veer makes a good argument that drugs are, is just a freedom of expression. And it is people trying to identify and pursue their own happiness. And, you know, if we, if we say that the pursuit of happiness is a freedom that specifically I'll be speaking to Americans here, but if the pursuit of happiness is something that we have, then, then drugs shouldn't be legal at all. 100% man. And that's exactly how I felt. And what I was trying to do is to provide spiritual enlightenment for, for people and to help them find their own way. Yeah. So, I, so I assume you didn't go to, to prison for 40 years. Yeah. So when I finally went to, to trial, but actually before trial even happened, the attorney that I had, I had to get the smarmiest, greasiest attorney in town who happened to know the district attorney. That's how it that, works. That, that's right. You know, you know, they all, they all get lunch and dinner together. They're all corrupt. They probably are swingers and they're, you know, yeah. hammering each other's wives. And those <laughs> kind of things. It's sort of typical of a small town justice system. That, that was part of the luck of it where I got arrested. The town that was, a bit smaller. So they all really, really knew each other and were well acquainted anyway. So behind closed doors, my attorney called up the district attorney and said, Hey, these kids aren't a problem. You know, yeah, this is, you know, this isn't big time stuff. Yeah. These aren't your guys. That's right. And I mentioned kids because at the very last part of the, the year, like right before my trial date, I was arrested. I was kidnapped again by these thugs. They came, I had moved out of that town to another town to show the, judge that I was moving away from that environment, sure, right? Yeah. It was a show of sh that, that I was trying to change effectively. Mm. 
And they said that the drugs that I had, the cocaine and MDMA had traveled through another town miles away. I think it was like 30 miles away. And because they knew that those drugs had traveled through that town, they justified charging me with, a, it was a, a, effectively a conspiracy charge. They said that I was engaging in organized criminal activity. Right. So really, you're the mastermind. That, that's right. That's right. So it, the thing that is so silly about it, and this speaks to the travesty of the criminal justice system, is that it was really just the same. It was another charge for the same drug. So it was like double jeopardy. Right. Just a way they could get away with, with it legally. Because anyway, they, they've got to get you. And, and as many that they compile up means that they have a better chance of securing one on you. That that's right, and they that they'll get more money from it as well. Of course, the sure. the other counties that were involved, and other cities that were involved in it, will be able to steal more of my money either through incarcerating me or putting me on probation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what happened is my attorney was able to get all the charges to run concurrently together: the organ, the criminal organization charge, plus the possession within to deliver charge, and the the manufacturing charge got dropped because I wasn't really manufacturing anything. Mm. But anyway, it, it all got put together and I got 10 years deferred adjudication probation is what my attorney was able to, okay. to, dole, to get doled out to me. And, and so you, ca you came out with this, you know, unfortunately, a, a pursuit of happiness charge, let's call it. <laughs> but you, you, you had this revelation. You were, like most people, I assume you went through government schools and you know, you were probably taught that you need to get a job and just life doesn't feel that fulfilling, but you start to open your mind in various ways. And, and for you, it was MDMA and your experience with the government and the judicial system. Where has that helped you land now? What, wh who is Sterling Lujan? That's right. Well, during that year that I was waiting to go to get on probation, I told you that everybody was really trying to make me feel guilty. And, you know, they were questioning the nature of who I was and, mm it was a really tumultuous period. But during that time, I also, because of a result of everybody hounding me and all this fear that had welled up, I started doing, and I'd already been doing a lot of reading, of course, after the first MDMA experience. As soon as I was done taking MDMA, I literally hopped on Wikipedia and started reading about everything I could, everything from philosophy to physics to gardening. If it was a topic, I was delving deeply into it. But there, after the arrest, the kidnapping, I started reading the anarchist philosophers, specifically the anarcho-capitalist philosophers. Mm. So I read Murray Rothbard's book, For a New Liberty. And, and were, you, you, were you aware that anarcho-communism was a thing, or was this your first toe into anarchy? Yeah, this was sort of my first toe into it. You know, that's a great question to kind of parse what I was doing, Ash, because I can't really remember how I, oh, I, I, okay, I, I think I remember how I kind of came into contact with specifically the anarcho-capitalist side of it. 2009 is when this went down. It was during Ron Paul's Love Illusion yeah. campaign. Yeah. And that I, that, I read Ron Paul's book first, actually, the, what was it? The Manifesto. The oh, yeah. Manifesto. Yeah, the Revolution Manifesto. And he referenced Rothbard in his oh, book right. for a new liberty and that, that therefore I went back and got Rothbard's book, read it. And chapter three of Rothbard's book has stuck with me ever since. And it's just called the state. And he breaks down the nature of a state being just a parasitical entity. That's simply a group of men who have a monopoly on the initiation of force over a large territory. And, and, and which Rothbard book was that for a new liberty for a new liberty? Okay. Yeah, it was, it's a bit dated now. It was written in the seventies. So if somebody were to go back and, read it all the examples are dated but the ideas are still perfectly relevant today of course so that book helped me realize that i'm an anarchist and i got online on, on the internet of course and, and let's let, let's define anarchist real quick before we uh, go too far yeah this is a good good point to do that so, so because th this word just like capitalism is is one that's thrown around by people in various positions as like we we cannot possibly devolve into anarchy and and i think it might just be a difference in definition here what's your definition of anarchy yeah that's a great a great thought so anarchy or anarchism literally means just means without rulers hmm. and it comes from the greek without and arcos 
is from the Greek chieftain or ruler. So anarchy literally means without rulers. It does not mean, which is what some people interpret it to mean, without rules, right? So society can have rules, however those come about so long as the individuals aren't trying to force compliance from other people or in other words, rule over them. So right. an anarchism is very specific mm -hmm. in that way. Now there's a lot of people, and this is, you mentioned the anarcho communists. There's a lot of people who like to debate on what constitutes rulership or ruling over another person. Sure. And in my view, you can only, you're only being ruled over if your consent is being broken. So if somebody does something to you in a non-consensual manner, mm -hmm. then they're ruling over you at that point. It, hence why a lot of anarcho-capitalists believe and live and have accepted the non-aggression principle, because if you are aggressing against someone, then that is breaking, forcing against someone's cons consent. You know, if, if you're not aggressing against them and you're still doing business with someone or just hanging out with someone, then, you know, it's, it's mutually, you know, uh, full of consent and both people find it valuable to spend their time in doing whatever it is, be it just hanging out, playing video games or, or, or going and buying a movie ticket. And both people are finding value in that. You don't have to be forced to do things that you want. Um, do you think that it, it helps our cause to use the word anarchy? This is something that I've struggled with. And, you know, I've, and rather than using anarchist, I like to use the term liberty entrepreneur, hence where this entire podcast came from. But w what's your feeling about just the word anarchy? Is it, is it something that worth fighting for? Yeah, this is an interesting subject. I've always held the position that it's perfectly fine to use the term anarchy or anarchist. Now that does cause a myriad of headaches to crop up as you move through life using the term because a lot of people are indoctrinated or propagandized to believe that anarchy means A, without rules, B, disorder, and C, chaos. So it's a constant struggle of having to educate people into the actual definition of, of the term. Mm. And I, I don't see a problem with that. I, I think there's some power to getting the term back under, under the light that it was meant to be shown in, right? It, it's not a nasty or an ugly term. It's something that is empowered. But there's also another flip side to this. There are people who call themselves anarchists mm -hmm. who we re really wouldn't describe a, as an anarchist or we, in the least we would have some refutations toward those people and their claims. But then we get into sort of some jiggly soft ground because there's this fallacy called a no true Scotsman, right? If you say, I'm, you know, you're not a real anarchist, you're not a true anarchist. Then of course you get into some fallacious area of what, you know, what's that supposed to mean? Who are you to judge what a real anarchist is or how you move that direction. But I think the term overall deserves to be, salvaged and deserves to be used at every step of the way because I think it's a very empowering term, hence why I called myself the psychologic anarchist. It, because I think it, it, in the least it generates important discussion. I think the term that you use is liberty entrepreneur and some people use the term voluntarist mm. or freedom advocate. Right. And some people even go even more vague and say free thinker. Yeah, liberty minded, right? right. Some, something of that nature and all those I think are fine, but I think we get really to the crux of the point when we say the term anarchy and use the term anarchism with conviction and passion. Right. But because it could using the term anarchy, we're not the anarchists that the media will portray on TV. The, those are, those are the guys and girls flipping over cop cars and busting in Starbucks windows. Yeah, right. Where, you know, so we, we anarcho capitalists, we are never portrayed ever in the news, right? Anytime anybody ever hears in school about what an anarchist is or sees on the news or reads in the newspaper what an anarchist is, it's always these people who are just, just against uh, social hierarchy, not necessarily rulers, you know, with regards to the application of force, but they don't like 
any type of social hierarchy. And that's why they tend to go towards communism where everybody is the same and everybody's poor and hungry and, you know, but for us, how do we get more exposure to the value creation and market-based side of anarchy? Because it has two, you know, whenever we call ourselves anarchists, it could invoke curiosity in someone. But I find that a lot of the times it's like, oh, you're one of those. It's like creates the opposite of a curious effect. Yeah, that's right. I, you know, I think there's a couple of things going on here. Of course, talking to people is a, always a great way to get them involved in thinking about anarchism, but that doesn't necessarily get them involved in thinking about the other side of anarcho-capitalists, which is that we have an interest in using and utilizing market forces to affect change, right? Now, we could just use the term anarcho-capitalist to get them thinking about the capitalistic side of this, but also, and as you'll as you referenced or alluded to earlier, even the term capitalist is hugely loaded for some people. Use the term capitalist and people lose their freaking minds. They're like, oh, you're an evil capitalist pig. You just want to have a shit ton of money and lord over everybody else and make them kiss the ring, of course. Mm -hmm. Capitalism, we can define that too real quick, just means ownership, private ownership over the means to production, generally speaking, but it also has a lot of implications, meaning the ability to accumulate capital, to generate wealth, mm -hmm. to be an entrepreneur, to start businesses, right? To hire, hire skilled and, labor. Yeah, and just be able to put capital, uh, both human capital and, and just uh, physical capital, and I guess intellectual capital into a pattern that creates wealth. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, so, and this is something I really enjoy doing as well, because I think besides just talking, I think what gets people involved in the capitalistic elements of what we're doing is just by building and creating things because a lot of the things that were built that anarcho capitalists are building in the modern day are a a actually helping generate more freedom by virtue of their effect, right? This is the age of decentralized technologies, the age of cryptocurrencies. And these technologies were actually created by anarchists, anarcho-capitalists, and we can get in this too, cypherpunks and crypto-anarchists. Right. Helped build these technologies for the sole purpose of building a freer society without even necessarily having to talk to people. Yeah, or, or having to change the current establishment. That's just, right. Just building an alternative to compete, to, to compete against the establishmentarians. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And because it reminds me of, of a, a little joke that I said on stage one time, actually at Anarchapoco, if you're not going to Anarchapoco, it's uh, February 13th through the 18th, 19th, 20th, whenever both Serling and I will be there uh, <laughs> speaking this year. So book your tickets and, and we'll see you down there. But you're right. You don't have to talk about it. And, and, and just think about this. Ludwig von Mises, his, uh, his, his, his treatise is not called human talking. It's called human action. And so if we're out there, and that's the whole point of being a Liberty entrepreneur, if you're out there building, I, I thought the other night, if a picture is worth a thousand words, what's an action worth? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And even if you can't, and you know, not everybody's going to be one of the builders themselves, but the beautiful thing about this technology is even if you're not actually out there building it and developing it or being, being on the capitalist side of it and, you know, gathering up the resources and put it, pulling the people together and having the vision for it, then you can actually simply just be using the technology to help get out of the system already. And there's a lot of power in that. And just a little example, and you, you'll be highly familiar with this example as well, Ash, but when the Steemit platform came into existence, all of us were easily swayed to get on and use this platform because it allowed us to generate revenue without having to work in the context of the system. And that is a, an extremely powerful thing because if we're generating cryptocurrency as a result of doing just writing articles, creating art or whatever it is we're doing, we're already helping escape the system because that's untaxed revenue that is going to whatever ends that we desire and it's a, an absolutely beautiful and amazing thing. So you can, and 
also doing this is an element of micro entrepreneurship that is really popping sure. up in society and that's literally everywhere you know everybody's an entrepreneur to some degree if they're everybody's working everybody's got a side hustle of some sort everybody's been able to side hustle you know it so as my listeners know i run a, a virtual assistant business out of the philippines and i thought the other day uh, video blockchain video games are are about to explode where you have ownership over your sword or your spell or, or whatever your character and you actually have blockchain ownership of this stuff and it's yours and the value that you create in game maybe you're mining gold in game or you're slaying a dragon and you get rewarded or you get that really special drop you know that really special shield of some sort you can sell this stuff and I, I had the idea I want to hire a virtual assistant that plays video games all day, but they're creating value in this video game where it pays for their salary. And there's a small margin on top for me to just operate this thing, you know, organize this thing. How, how cool is that? That everybody can be an entrepreneur now. It's easier than ever to be an entrepreneur. There's, there's so much connectivity and so many tools and so much opportunity and so much money competition that you just got to find your spot. And so it's, it's really awesome. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely amazing because it, there's all kinds of digital niches where people can work. And just a little bit about my backstory, and this helps do a little continuation of what we were talking about. After I became an anarchist and after I, and this is sort of the end of the story, I was only on probation for five years because I was able to write a letter to the judge, tell the judge that I had been a good boy and I followed all their rules and all of that all of their malarkey and then right. he let me off of probation. And also during that time, as I was hanging out online, of course I came into contact, like I said, with the crypto anarchists and I learned about Bitcoin pretty early on around 2013, started writing about Bitcoin, making Facebook posts about cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies. Yep. And then in 2015, I went to the Porcupine Freedom Festival in New Hampshire and that was the first time I actually got to use Bitcoin in a real live transaction. Right. For anybody who doesn't know, the Porcupine Freedom Festival in New Hampshire is part of the Free State Project. And it is really a hub for liberty-minded people to congregate. And they're, that's a once-a-year once a festival that they have. Now, there's a lot that's changed since when I went a couple of years ago, as I've heard. But that was really a crowning moment in my foray into the cryptocurrency ecosystem because I, I realized that had the power of this technology I actually went back to my wife, Cecilia, after I went to that conference, it was like they were going full all in on Bitcoin and the price I think at the time was like three or $400. So we bought a bunch of Bitcoin. I started an account on steam and I was an early adopter. I made, made posts, did really well. I got actually, Jeff Berwick saw a video that I made about steam and he came on to steam and then like the whole, anarchist cavalcade. No, for came sure. Out. So I so I take full blame for that ultimately. <laughs> and and then same year, 2015, this was a, a very important year. Roger started bitcoin.com. He had acquired the domain name I think the previous year in 2014, and I was working on a Facebook page called The Art of Not Being Governed. Mm. And I was making memes. I was fully enmeshed in meme warfare. <laughs> and a close ally and buddy of mine, Jamie Redman, who's a crypto journalist and has yep. been really great one. He basically headhunted me for Roger to come onto the Bitcoin.com team. So I started as a crypto journalist on at Bitcoin.com. And it all and, just came out of passion. It all just came out of stuff you're doing in your free time. A hobby turned into your business. That, that's right. It was all a snowball effect from my early experiences. And, and, and you know, my very first experience as someone who was, not only an anarchist, but an entrepreneur was in selling mass quantities of drugs. <laughs> so it was a very, Hey, that's just their era. rules that say you can't do that's, that. That's, 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 that's their rules. That's absolutely right. Selling drugs is good business, man. Even, yeah. you know, you know that the pharmaceutical industrial complex makes billions of dollars in revenue a year. From and that's why all of these other drugs like marijuana and MDMA and stuff like that are illegal. You know, hemp for crying out loud, get, get CBD, give me a break. You know, I'm, I'm currently here in Denver, Colorado, and, and we're lucky enough to not have goons come kick in our door and kidnap us and throw us in a cage if we're smoking a plant. But, you know, there. I want to just congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Drugs. 
That's <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, having drugs banned for governments and certain companies, specifically the pharmaceutical industrial complex, is a that's a you know that's a business plan because it allows them to monopolize certain absolutely. industries. Yeah. So that's a. It, I think that without getting into the weeds, we will move forward and we'll continue to do everything we can to make drugs as legal, quote unquote, as possible. What should happen in the end is just government should be absolutely abolished and all drugs should be available for anybody who wants them or needs them. And then we will deal with people with compassionately who, who get addictions. And instead of locking these people up in a cage and ruining countless people's lives, you know, we would treat addiction as a health concern rather than a state or legality concern. It's, it's always one thing that, you know, has really bugged me. But um, so, so let's keep going on the path here with Bitcoin.com. And I want to really start getting into the psychologic anarchist and what that means. Sure, sure. And so uh, at the same time that I started working for Bitcoin.com, yeah, this is a good point to talk about this. When I started for Bitcoin.com in 2015, I started working, getting into the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Something happened simultaneously, and it makes my story really multifaceted. But I mentioned I had finished my degree in psychology. I also started working on a master's degree in counseling. I, I really wanted to be a counselor because I'd al I've always had a passion for helping people, be it on an individual basis or a very large scale. And I was working on being a counselor, I was also thinking about anarchism, of course, at the same time. And I thought, you know what? There hasn't been very many people who have tried to combine or synthesize the anarcho-capitalist or anarchist ideas with therapeutic ideas. Hmm. So in this also occurred in 2015. I created the Facebook page Psychologic Anarchist, which is now, for anybody who doesn't know, it's com it's gone because... Facebook censored it. They, during their massive call last year, they removed my page completely, and I wrote a appeal that they never got it back. So anyway, Psychologic Anarchist was called out of existence. But when I started writing about these ideas, combining and synthesizing anarchism and psychology, I came up with this idea called relational anarchism. And this is simply the idea that if we're working with people to be as compassionate and as decent as possible, if we're actually trying to connect with people on a very deep level as we move through this life, we are creating the necessary and sufficient conditions to build anarchist or anarcho-capitalist societies. Mm. Because if you're being empathetic with people, that is the antithesis of coercing another person or harming another person. Because if you feel a true connection with another person, you're unlikely to use violence to harm that person. Right. So this is the key idea that I came to an understanding of through studying psychology and combining those ideas mm -hmm. with psychology. So I made some of the, probably some of the first posts regarding the importance of the connection of empathy, nonviolent communication, mm -hmm. and all those ideas in between with anarchism. I think this is where some of your best work is, you know, I know that you write very well for Bitcoin.com, but you know, a lot of people write very well for cryptocurrencies. I think True. your real strength is relating the interpersonal type of, of skill sets and helping use that to establish how, how small anarchy can be. I mean, you know, in, in the most individual sense, anarchy is within yourself. Are you using force against your own feelings and your own thoughts? Are you trying to suppress that stuff? Or are you in a place where you can be curious and have compassion for your younger self? For me, that is true anarchy. And then once you have that, that peace and that harmony of respecting who you are and who you have been, right? Who you have been, the stuff that builds up in you. If you have the curiosity and compassion to basically allow that to release and connect with yourself, then you have the fundamentals to connect with other people in that same peaceful way. And that is the beautiful anarchy. Yeah, that's a, a amazingly said, Ash. That's exactly how I feel. Because if we're coming to terms with who we are as human beings, if we've been able to 
try to deal with our trauma. And here's one of the big things, I think, one of the key insights that comes out of all of this. If we really think about it, the nature of the state as a cold, detached, bureaucratic entity that's emotionless and lifeless is a consequence of the way that we were raised, of the traumas that we were dealt with, of the suffering that people endured. Because as children, a lot of us have our emotional life squashed underfoot Mm. by people that think that children should just be obedient and follow and they shouldn't be able to have an emotional response. Yes. Seen and not heard. I can't count the number of times my own mother said children should be seen and not heard. Like, where's the curiosity there? You know, children are smashed. And this is why I had, I had David Rodriguez on my show yep. not too long ago. You know, Saw I call them the, the four evil peas, the, the, the peas that crush children and turn them into these propagandize drones that just accept government force. It's the evil peas are parents, politicians, pastors, and professors. You know, the, these are people that, that aren't really aren't pretty much ever curious about a child. And they, they take out all the beauty in children that would allow them to be a peaceful anarchist. Yeah, it, it puts in them this disacceptance, unacceptance of themselves, this unimportance, this you have to follow in, you know, fall in line that we have this cultural established hierarchy and you have to pay attention and listen and obey. That's, that, that's right. You know, and there was a really, really great book that covers this subject. The author wasn't an anarchist, but Ultimately, what she was getting at was strongly anarchist ideas. So there was a psychotherapist, psychologist by the name of, I think it's Ann Miller, Alice Miller, excuse me, Alice Miller. And Alice Miller wrote a book called For Your Own Good Mm. in the, I want to say it was in the 80s or the 90s. But she worked with children through the majority of her career. And what she came to, what she said that happened to children is what she came to call the toxic pedagogy where effectively children were raised up in environments where there were, they were not, and we discussed this just a bit just now, but they were not allowed to have emotional content. And then they were, that was suppressed. But then at at the very end of it, they would come out prepared to obey commands and authorities. And what's interesting about her book is she delves specifically into the disciplinary lifestyle of Nazi Germany Mm. and how German children were treated. And she even delved into Hitler's own life of how his father beat him and kept his emotions squashed. And this was typical Mm -hmm. of the individual who lived in Nazi Germany. And it's this kind of totalitarian lifestyle and this disciplinarian parenting ideology that causes children to lose a sense of, connection with other human beings because they don't have that emotional drive to make, make those connections. So when the time comes for them to obey and follow order, even if that order means harming or killing another human being, they're going to do it without question, which is an absolute tragedy. But her book really gave me some insight and provides anyone insight who reads it into the nature of how people behave based on their early childhood experiences and their early trauma. And, you know, this is, now this is almost a foregone conclusion. Everybody, I think, deep down knows this. Even if they disagree with it, they know they've heard these particular sure. arguments and ideas before. But, yeah, I really recommend for anybody who wants to delve deeper into the subject, Alice Miller's book, Still Relevant. We'll put it in the show notes. Thank you. Um, do you think this authoritarian, disciplinarian way of raising children is one of the key factors of why when those children grow up, they don't trust the marketplace, but they, they trust government regulations, for instance. Yeah, I think that's the case because if you grow up, if anybody grows up in an authoritarian environment, or if anyone grows up in general, but yes. (laughs) Yeah. Right. 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 We're all, are they going to grow up at all? In this authoritarian environment, you just get used to obeying commands and dictates. Mm. So people are from a very early age, they are shunned from experiencing freedom or what it means to interact with other human beings in a totally free way. And so that is echoed later on in life when people have any association with the free market, which is just a synonym for direct 
freedom of exchange mm. of value with other people. And if people weren't able to exchange value, any kind of value early on without that, that authority or that ruler intervening right. on their behalf, well, then they're going to naturally be predisposed to not wanting to work with other people in a free market environment. And, and now they have skeptical. And just be skeptical of these other people that, because that's right. this person's probably going to screw me because there's no government in between us. There's no authority in between us. That, that's right. There's no one there to protect us. Right. Because that's the key indoctrinating story or narrative that governments tell us is that government has to be there to protect us. And this is also why, and, and this is talked about in Alice Miller's book as well as other books, why the state always manifests as a parental figure, right? The fatherland, the motherland, Uncle Sam, Uncle right? Sam, right? Yeah. If people see government as this metaphorical mommy and daddy figure, they're going to have a natural instinct to have it protect right. every single person. But the reality of the situation is tragic because that's not what happens. Governments aren't, in the least, they're not the good parents who are going to protect you. Instead, they're going to harm you Every step of the way, they're going to abuse you. They're going to subjugate and subdue you rather than help you because they're the authoritarian, abusive asshole of a parent. Yeah, not a far cry from what most parents are. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's right. I mean, most, but most parenting is – we have a crisis in parenting, and we've always had a crisis in parenting, and it leads us to a, the acceptance of government. You know, I've, I've long thought now that – trying to get rid of government is, is not the path. So I went path of building freedom, but I also hope one day to go the path of parenting, peaceful parenting Same. And, and, yep. and, and building, you know, helping provide the environment for a child to find that strength and find that connection rather than me feeling like, Oh, you have to do it my way. I know best. I'm the parent. And then they grow up thinking, Oh, the government's the same thing. It's just another parent. 100%. Yeah. And I think this path toward free, we can talk about solutions, but you're, you're right. It's not, it's not just about outright abolishing the state. I think that's the ultimate goal is we want the state abolished, but in order to do that, it's a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach. So we need the peaceful parenting. We need adults to be empathetic. We need the connection and the communication piece, but we also need things like agorism. We need entrepreneurship. We need all of these, this, swirl this beautiful swirl of different ideas to come together in a magnificent way to generate more freedom in every aspect of the reality that we find ourselves in if we can do that then i think we're moving in the direction that we need to move the as, and starts I, to di dissipate at that, that point that, that absolutely that's and i think that's that's happening right now we can see the growth mm. where like you mentioned we're both going to anarchapulco anarchapulco to me is a, is a beautiful symbol of how fast and furious the anarchist community is growing. You know, and there's been anarchist communities all through his, throughout history, especially in the 1800s when all kinds of anarchists were really everywhere. But as a result of communication, the growth of communication technologies, entrepreneurship, development of uh, c communication internet-based tech, now we're seeing more and more people come into the fold because they're ha they're being exposed to the ideas, but not only are they being exposed to the ideas, they're also being exposed to the empathetic and kind and compassionate people who call themselves anarchists. That's not to say that all anarchists are all of us at, at our core are hurt or harmed in some way. I don't think any of us in the current environment grew up in a way that was completely beneficial, maybe a handful, mm. but I, I think we're all, trying to overcome our different traumas. But I think in the process of that, we're understanding that in order to abolish the state, we need to treat our children with dignity and respect. We need to treat other people with dignity and respect. Yep. In, in the least, we need to use as much compassion and empathy as possible and understand where the other person's coming from. And I want to say this, I'm not an expert in this topic in the sense that, that I'm perfect at it, right? I have my own shortcomings. It's very difficult to be constantly compassionate because we live in a toxic environment where people are constantly projecting their traumas onto you. And I see this online all the time Oh my because gosh. Pe people can be faceless essentially and not have to worry about having any kind of, that's yeah. right. No repercussions, no consequences. They don't, they're not standing there face to face with a person so they can really be nasty to you and they can right. vent all of their, their emotional content. And so it's very easy to become defensive, especially if you're a public 
persona and you're more well known in the community, you get it's very, that's right. That's right. And I'll, it's, I'll have just random people attack me on Twitter. It's, you know, the longer I'm on Twitter, the more successful I believe government schools have been. <laughs> that's a great observation. It's, it, it's true. And this is definitely the output of public schooling is that, you know, there's no, Public schools, the last thing they're going to teach people is how to communicate, empathize, and, and think. Like, none of that is on the priority. It's all about rote memorization of unimportant historical facts that the victors wrote about. Right? That, that so, they wrote, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it has very little to do with um, actually the process of learning. You know, I just watched a short clip from uh, Isaac Morehouse, who has been on the show. Uh, he's the co-founder of Praxis. It's an alternative to college for students who are looking to uh, get actual experience in building with entrepreneurs rather than going to college and just memorizing a whole bunch of shit again. Right. You know, they, they were going through the skills that um, what people said they wish they learned in high school and then what they actually learned that they, uh, they never use. And it's, it's really amazing that, yeah, we're just stuck in there and we, we memorize some random shit for 12 years and then, uh, th then there you go. <laughs> but, and I want to point that you're exactly right. I want to, I want to point this out for your listeners. This isn't just a guesswork that you and I are going through about the education system. It's not just us observing it and saying, this is what they're doing. I mean, it's, that's partly it, but this is actually the modus operandi of the public education system. David might've talked about this on your podcast, but this is what's been referred to as the Prussian model of education. German engineered. And that's right. This, this model of education is just to create obedient worker drones and people who will follow commands without any, any questions. So the United States and the, uh, the majority of Western schools and probably Eastern schools will have adopted to some degree, this authoritarian methodology for raising the young. It's, and it goes back to Alice's Miller. It's part of, part of the Alice Miller's idea of the poisonous pedagogy or mm -hmm. the toxic pedagogy. You raise up children, squash their emotions, mm -hmm. teach them unimportant facts, and they're ready to follow without questioning anything. Right. So the environment that we live in is the fallout of bad parenting, of statism, and of all this nastiness combined, and it's created sort of a toxic deluge of pain and suffering. And the good news is I think we're starting to, to come to the other side there. I mean, even with people like yourself and Brene Brown and, you know, as much as people want to hate on the millennials and me being one, apparently, since I was born in 1982, I'm kind of the OG millennial. So I can both relate and like look from the outside, but you know, stuff like compassion and stuff like curiosity. And these, this is a generation that is paying more attention to their emotions. Granted, their emotions run wild a lot of the times and they, they, they see things in society that they, they feel are forced or aren't fair. And unfortunately they are still looking to the government to correct these things. But finally, I think for about the first time ever, uh, men are now allowed to even think that they have emotions and question their emotions. And they're starting to become a society where men are able to express their emotions. People always talk about the patriarchy and, and the feminist movement, but I think under the currents, we're starting to see men, a men's movement of emotional acceptance. Are you seeing that? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Now there is some, something I think we need to talk about in this that help, will help us clarify the situation that we find ourselves in. So yes, we have more, the idea of emotional expressiveness for men is definitely coming into the fray. I can see that for sure, especially as more men talk about the importance of emotions in a public forum, just like we're doing right now via the internet. But at the same time, we also have this sort of rampant or toxic leftist type of movement where mm. people are also believed to be entitled to certain things. And then there's also sort of a movement for just blind acceptance of any kind of person, no matter what their identity is, even if those people are assholes or if those people are trying to harm others. So this, this blind acceptance isn't just an acceptance for our dignity and decency for an individual. It's acceptance for an individual, even if they're wanting to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes along with some of these 
these ideas from the leftist camp. So in, in a way, to some degree, it's also been, uh, it's, it's almost impacted in the form of overkill, in the form of leftism. So I, all I'm saying is we have to be careful to make sure that we also have an, a healthy understanding of boundaries, right? Sure. And I think that's what the, the, the quote political left is lacking. They yes. They, they want they they're and pushing their mo- yeah that that's right. They're pushing their movement to such a strong degree that they just want to have blind acceptance for anything. They yeah. almost it almost seems like they want to revel in in squalor and you know bring everybody on board. And don't get me wrong, I'm not I, I'm not for any kind of right or alt right movement or left or left specific movement. I'm just observe just this is what I see, and I'm just saying we need to be careful to make sure. We develop healthy boundaries because that's an important psychological component of the piece. So that doesn't mean don't be compassionate, don't accept people for their particular proclivities, which is an anarchist principle. It just means don't let them run over you. Right. right. Yeah, for, for sure. And that's what's happening in this whole toxic masculinity movement right now. Yes. Men are being shamed and blamed. And if, if these if these people really cared about, you know, finding a solution to what they consider toxic masculinity, which they don't, they don't care at all. They just want to blame and shame and put men in a box. But if they did the cure, if you will, or the solution to toxic masculinity, and this is their term, not mine. I would never call any, any male toxic. Right. I wouldn't call any female toxic. This is just not language I use, but if they want to find a solution to toxic masculinity, I hope that they, start using curiosity around those men and starting to learn what, what these emotions are within them that, that calls them to act out. You know, a lot of, a lot of young boys are raised by single mothers these days as well. And it, you don't just, you go, yeah, me, me too. Fuck. Yeah. And then a countless random, you know, uh, stepfathers, but the cure to people acting out their emotions is curiosity, not blame and shame. So That's I, right. I, I don't have any, thought that what the left currently is doing is going to progress humanity in the compassionate way, the anarchist way that we're looking for. It's going to cause more divide. It's going to cause more hurt and more anger. And it's going to cause more men to not just not want to be around these types of people because they're the scapegoat. They're the blamers. Yeah, that's right. And then of course, this goes without saying, but the left also has a penchant for wanting to use governments to enforce people to comply to whatever their viewpoint of identity politics is the the flavor of the day, so to speak. So that, and that's also just that amplifies the trauma and the, the nastiness that's surrounding government, et cetera. So I think the anarchists have it right. in the fact that we want to build things, we actually do want to connect with people and we want to provide viable non-government solutions for the, the most vexing problems of the day with the ultimate goal of abolishing governments and then allowing people to associate freely with the people that they think most fit their lifestyle. And that means within the context of any given territory. It's, it's so beautifully said. I think that you're one of the, the best poets, not that you write poems, but (laughs) just writers of the ideas of, of freedom and Liberty and anarchism. You are, unabashed you speak your mind you speak a lot of truth and i have so much respect for you i hope there's more people that that start to express themselves confidently with the moral argument of what anarcho-capitalism brings to the table and you know don't be afraid to speak this stuff if you understand it and if you believe it and if you're passionate if you live by it and if you truly think that peace is the way that we're going to solve the world's problems not from more top-down regulations and force but sterling it has been such an amazing conversation with you today it kind of went all over the place but we that may be because i haven't spoken with you in a year but (laughs) i i can't wait to see you in anarcho poco Oh, absolutely. And thanks for saying that earlier. I feel the same about you, Ash. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing to help get more people involved with not only anarchism, but entrepreneurship, free market thinking, and all the beautiful things that go along with that. So thank you for what you do. And I can't wait to see you in Anarchapoco as well. This was an amazing talk. I think it's okay that we kind of <laughs> del- delved into the, a bunch of different areas. There's a lot to talk about. So. There is a lot to talk about. And if you could just drop uh, some of your links and how people can stay up to date with you. 
Yeah, sure. So you, you mentioned it at the very beginning. Anyone can find me at sterlinluhan.com. Also, you can search. I do a lot of writing for Bitcoin.com, of course. I constantly stay abreast of everything happening happening in the technological cryptocurrency sphere. So I write a lot of op-eds at news.bitcoin.com. And also, this is really important, I've started using a new platform that's cropped up that I recommend everybody start to merge over to called Minds. Mm. Minds.com. I've heard of them. Yeah, it's a blockchain-based social media platform, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And it's actually built out, and they're working on front-end solutions. My biggest, and I won't get into this right now, but the biggest criticism about Steam, it, there hasn't been a lot of changes on the front end. Minds has been really is completely developing out a really great platform and it's they're strict anti-censorship so that's extremely important find me mm -hmm. on minds and i'm going to be posting my newest video content i just started my vlog for for minds.com and i intend on publishing my first video today actually it should be published. oh congratulations well yeah. you're a you're a self-made man you're a liberty entrepreneur if i've ever met one sterling luhan it's been such a pleasure thank you for coming on to liberty entrepreneurs podcast Thanks, Ash. Keep doing what you're doing, brother. Yeah, thanks, man. Yep.